latest book, The Economy of Happiness, is based on successful implementation of game changes business and describe principles that establish the pursuit of health and happiness. Querido Gunter, in a few days, it will be 10 years since uh, your first conference in IAC, exactly on uh, 11, of, 11 of May 2011, where I had the privilege of, met, of meet with you for an interview, collecting some of uh, your great ideas in this little book, you remember? That, Very well. Uh, we published them. Muchas gracias, querido amigo, por estar otra vez con nosotros. Dear friends, today, again with us, Mr. Gunter Pauli. Bueno, ik, um, do you hear me, Willy? Perfectly. Okay, oh. great. Uh, we were just uh, trying to find the, uh, no, 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 no. Don't make me a god by having a, <laughs> an Oriole on top of my head. <laughs> um, uh, that was my sister who just uh, wanted to make certain that I'm a little bit more visible. Um, well, well, Willie, what a pleasure to be with you. Um, what a privilege to be with IAC. And, and first of all, my apologies for last week because uh, I was ready to join you. And then we had this, uh, this delay of my flights and delay of the flights and, and, and three hours delay. And when I finally was ready to get online with all of you, um, my flight was to take off and I was uh, forced to, to, to drop the ball. So um, my, my apologies for that. That, that was uh, totally unintentional. And I'm very glad that uh, thanks to the swift reaction of Willie and the team of IAC, uh, uh, we're able to uh, turn things around and, and, and be together here uh, for this uh, evening session. Um, I think it's very important that when we are in a period of, uh, I would not say of crisis, but I would say a period of confusion. Um, the world doesn't know what it is doing and it doesn't know what it has to do. Um, uh, you know, we have a, <coughs> a situation whereby uh, we are supposedly having a common enemy and that common enemy is uh, this time called the virus. But usually when you have a common enemy, uh, you should mobilize everyone and undertake joint initiatives and efforts so that uh, you can jointly undertake initiatives to, to strengthen your position. And, and for some strange reason, uh, the world has decided that they are not going to mobilize everyone against the common enemy, but we have decided, not we, but the politicians have decided to immobilize everyone. It is, uh, it is a rather amazing situation. Um, and so in this period of confusion, I think we have to have uh, one very clear um, position. The position is that when everyone stops and locks, you, the one who takes initiative, will be the one who sets the agenda. And to me, this is a very important point. Ladies and gentlemen, friends at the AC, um, if you take initiatives now, if you have bold positions now, you are deciding the agenda for years to come. Uh, because the, everyone else is only worried about an agenda that's related to viruses and is not related to, to economy, urban design, not related to the revival of the economy and the search for what I would call happiness. So this is a, this is a very um, unique situation whereby uh, we have a much larger degree of freedom uh, to take initiatives and we have a, a much larger degree of freedom to be bold. And, and I think um, about a year ago when the whole uh, confusion started, I decided to, to start writing a series of books. And the books that I'm going to write is called the Solution Series. 
And the solution series are more than 100 books that will be published over the next 12 to 15 years. And those books will take each single subject that we have, object that we have, we consume, we produce, we have at home, and we will rethink how could we ever turn that into something that is 100% renewable, sustainable, creative, amusing, challenging, because it is not a matter of just becoming um, sustainable. <clears throat> it is not a matter of just designing products that are going to be biodegradable. It is a matter of turning products again as a challenge, as a challenge so that we can use the best of our minds, the best of our knowledge, the best of our intentions, and that we can rethink um, the whole portfolio of objects uh, around us. Um, we started thinking, uh, of course, with some of the very obvious uh, problematic products around us, uh, like, uh, like plastics. I mean, plastics has given us an enormous amount of uh, comfort and luxury, um, but at the same time, plastics, for some strange reason, were never designed to degrade in the sun, in the sea, and in the soil. Just, just stop for a second. Just stop for a second and know that there is not one engineering university, chemical engineering university in the world, where the students who learn chemical engineering learn how to design molecules that degrade in the sun, in the sea, and in the soil. To me, this is, this is an incredible oversight. And this incredible oversight is something that uh, we, we are now paying a high price for. Because not only do we have plastics, which are polymers made from petroleum, but on top of that, we have been filling these plastics with a lot of additives. And, and while all of you love to work with 3D printers, I wonder if you are aware of the additives that are included in the 3D printers so that you are not one point in time um, putting some toxic or nocive uh, uh, matters or gases uh, into the solid to the water or in the air. This is a very important component. Uh, we are not even teaching today the chemical engineers how to design the molecules to be sustainable. And then, of course, we wonder how is it ever possible that we have every year millions of tons of plastics that end up in the ocean and that have no way of uh, being removed uh, from the ocean with the present technologies. <clears throat> One of the greatest critiques we have had in the past is that we always design uh, for fast assembly and easy assembly and smart assembly, but we do not seem to be capable to imagine how to design for disassembly. And disassembly is not just how to take the big pieces apart. The disassembly is how do we deal with all the micro and nanoplastics that emerge because we seem to have this incapacity uh, to design something that uh, will not leave, in the end of the day, a film of uh, polymers in tiny little pieces on the bottom of the ocean. Now, if we realize that uh, not only are we um, putting microplastics uh, in the sea at the rate of trillions a day, um, at the same time, we're having these uh, microplastics that are full with additives like fire retardants, like ultraviolet blockers. Um, I wonder if you have checked uh, your 3D printers, if uh, your, your 3D uh, print material has an ultraviolet blocker, and I'm, I'm quite sure it has. Um, if it includes a fire retardant, and I'm quite sure it has. Um, just like 90% of all plastics that we have in our home, in our built environment, all of them have ultraviolet blockers and uh, fire retardants. Now, if it has a fire retardant, that means that even if you burn it at a thousand degrees, 
it will not destroy. So what have we done? Um, and, and this is uh, the first part of my major question when we're starting looking for solutions. Are we in a position to imagine solutions whereby we go beyond what we know today and we can have a very fresh and creative new approach uh, to exactly the same challenges, but using what nature has been producing for us over the past centuries and millennia. Um, it, is, it is very interesting that uh, when we start uh, looking at all the solutions that um, we see emerging related to plastics, um, uh, the, the key uh, element that is very often missing is not the technology, but the business model. We don't seem to have solutions that make business sense. Um, we all too often find solutions that require, in the end of the day, a major subsidy, a major government intervention. And, and if the private sector has been causing these difficulties in the past by designing what is wrong for the future, then I think it is very urgent that the private sector not only takes responsibility for its errors of the past, cleans up the errors of the past, but at the same time, will start focusing on getting the new options towards the future. And since we are not talking about one product or two products, but let's say a hundred products, um, we realize that the, 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 the field for innovation is vast. And I would say that is the good news. The good news is that there is a, a vast opportunity to rethink how we're doing everything. Let me give you a second example. Um, when, when we are looking for solutions, um, as Willie, you know very well, I always look for solutions uh, that uh, have been proven in nature. Um, if, if I ask you, what is the most efficient way of getting a tiny particle out of something, um, then very often we wonder, what are we talking about? So what is the most efficient way of taking something out of liquid? Vortex. Thank you for mentioning the vortex. Um, let me let me also talk about a few other options, of course, <laughs> um, which is uh, very much appreciated. Oh, you okay. guess uh, okay. yeah. Sorry. Um, so let us let us uh, look at uh, our lungs. I mean, our lungs have been very much debated uh, under these uh, stressful periods. But uh, let us just for one second reflect about how do our lungs work. Um, uh, you know, when you are breathing and when you're breathing and what are we doing? When you're breathing, somehow you have these little sponges that are part of our lungs and they are connected with the thousands of capillary veins. And when you're breathing, somehow on the interface of the sponge and the capillary, the CO2 is taken out and the oxygen is put in. Now, that is an amazing process because uh, let us not forget that uh, this is uh, a, a, a minute exchange um, whereby oxygen goes in and CO2 is taken out. <coughs> so we challenged uh, a group of scientists who had been studying the function of the lungs for many years. And uh, we asked if that uh, very efficient technique of taking the CO2 out, if we could not slightly modify that and use it to take the, the, the microplastics out. And, and amazingly, um, using exactly the same technique, which is based on microfluids, 
when you're using the microfluids, you immediately discover that it is possible with a very little amount of energy, because the smaller your pipes, the less energy there is needed. Your whole lungs is actually only operating on, on less than a tenth of a bar. And so when we're able to use just a tenth of a bar in order to process uh, this whole uh, exchange of oxygen and uh, CO2, we are uh, able to see that we can do the same for plastics. Now, what does it mean? Concretely, we have the first systems in operation that allow us to take a thousand liters of seawater, a thousand liters of seawater. We let it run through a, a stack of CDs and this 1000 liters of water in one second has all the microplastics removed. Now, that is the kind of breakthroughs we need. Now, what I'm, wh why is this so fascinating? And I think this is important why uh, I always enjoy talking to Willie and, and your team at IAC, because we want to do urban design. We want to do regional design. We want to invent new ways of creating quality of life. And one of the elements that we think in the next years uh, that will be very highly appreciated, uh, not just by the public at large, but also by the policymakers, one of the, the great uh, opportunities is that we could create something that I call microplastic free zones. Now, um, uh, we, when you have uh, the capacity to cleanse a thousand liters per second, that means in one day you can, sorry, in one month, you can cleanse 30 square kilometers of seawater from microplastics. Now, for the first time, we're having a perspective that uh, makes us envision something that is very different from today. If you go to Sitges, um, you know, just outside of Barcelona, and you make an analysis of the amount of microplastics uh, suspended in the water, I'm being told that it's between 5,000 and 8,000 microparticles per liter of seawater. Now, who wants to go and swim in stitches in the water? I mean, this is like going to swim in, in a soup of plastics. Um, and, and what is now the opportunity that if we are, can create a zone that is protected uh, by either membranes or, or seaweeds, uh, and that these seaweeds create a first barrier, but on the inside, you can create this intensive cleansing system. That cleansing system allows you to create these microplastics free zones. And, and, and what, a, what a unique marketing tool this is. What a, a unique way to invite people to reconnect uh, to their sea, um, where we have been fighting pollution for many years, where we have imposed uh, many new rules and regulations to avoid uh, you know, the oil spills uh, and, the, and the sewage uh, being uh, blended uh, along the coast. And now we see an opportunity to, on top of that, ensure that we have a high quality water. And, and this may be good for tourism. This means that uh, maybe Barcelona will be the first city in the world that will create microplastic free zones so that the local population uh, can undo the errors of the past and maintain uh, the cleansiness uh, that uh, is uh, required. But at the same time, uh, we now can see how fish culture, um, how um, uh, fish farming, how, how uh, crustaceans, uh, how shellfishes, how oysters, how could we farm this in a protected environment? And there is no doubt about it that uh, when you're able to say that your oysters are, are going to be uh, microplastics free, well, in that case, 
uh, you will command a premium price. And, and, and I think this is the kind of new platforms for, for urban design, for coastal design, uh, that we will uh, see emerge in the years to come. And, and <clears throat> it is these kind of new technologies um, that are all based on 3D printing, um, whereby you have uh, a lot of waste streams uh, that uh, are being generated because in these CDs you are accumulating uh, all the microplastics. Now these microplastics you will then be able to subject to a pyrolysis and a pyrolysis means that at very high temperature you're destroying the mess of the past. Um, but while you're destroying uh, the mess of the past it uh, allows you uh, to actually start generating hydrogen. So who guessed that by doing a cleanup of uh, the microplastics uh, from the sea, we are actually entering into a hydrogen economy? Uh, you know, this is system design. This is what I call urban design. This is creating new living conditions. And, and this is starting from the crisis and starting from the drama, <coughs> but having the full opportunity to imagine the concrete steps that uh, will give you quality of food, quality of the coastal life, and of course, uh, a peace of mind that you're able to operate in a uh, living conditions. You know, uh, as uh, Willie mentioned, uh, I have uh, uh, last year published uh, my book uh, called The Economy of Happiness. And the economy of happiness is a very, uh, a very basic analysis. It, uh, I'm just asking myself, what are the conditions uh, that we need in a community, in a society to be happy? And, and, and let me start from, from the negative side. If there are a lot of people unemployed, can you be happy? Of course not. I mean, when there is a lot of people unemployed, then you will not have happiness. Uh, second, when you have a lot of pollution, when your coastal waters are dirty, uh, when you can't breathe uh, fresh air, when you don't have uh, the quality of water that you desire, um, are you going to be happy? Of course you're not happy. Um, so what uh, what we're seeing in in uh, in the in the platform for happiness is that we are in need of generating more jobs. We have to have a higher level of employment, and second, we need to have um, a strategy to really create a quality of water and air and a quality of life. Uh, that is most likely difficult to achieve when you are in a very large megalopolis. You need to be able to manage this at a smaller level, at smaller scales, and with uh, uh, greater direct concern. Um, I have uh, looked uh, in the book, which I, I don't have the time to go into detail now, but uh, I looked in the book at all the different conditions that are very conducive to happiness. And then I looked at five uh, projects that I have been involved in around the world, um, which uh, it seems like we have happiness. And, and, and this sense of happiness or sense of satisfaction, um, of course, is not only a matter of the happiness, but of, it is immediately is also reflected in 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 what we call health. Um, being happy and healthy uh, all very often goes hands in hand. Um, really, you know very well for many years already our case of uh, Las Gaviotas, uh, the Las Gaviotas case in Colombia, uh, which today, after 35 years, remains the only region in Colombia where there is full employment. 
and and as you may remember um we had such a successful strategy not only in job generation and economic development that um, um the population in one generation always part of uh, of middle class uh, but more than being part of middle class uh, what has happened that uh, everyone drinks uh, very healthy water, everyone has clean air, um, everyone lives in a bioclimatic home, everyone lives in a bioclimatic home. And uh, as a result of all of them, um, as a result of all of these conditions being met, um, uh, people going around in, in the, on a bicycle and uh, drinking uh, and eating healthy, the result is that, you know, after about 15 years, we had to close the hospital for lack of patients. Now, how happy is a community when you can close the hospital because of lack of patients? And, and, and while this seems to be uh, the ultimate goal and, 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 and an impossible objective, but, you know, we have achieved that objective and we have succeeded in putting this into practice and and therefore the design uh, for blue economy or the design for these uh, innovations uh, can lead to the design of an economy that is conducive uh, to being happy and healthy and and to me this is uh, the key element that uh, i wanted to bring in this uh, first part uh, of of my my presentation um, because it's by design that you do this this is not because there was coincidence it was the clear intention and that is why you know as uh, advanced architecture advanced uh, urbanism we need to have clear intentions and if these intentions are not ambitious enough then we're missing opportunities and today as I said in the very beginning, we have to be very bold in, in our statements. We have to be very bold in, in our proposals because this is the time to do it. But also this is the time to be bold and to focus on those implementations. Um, <coughs> but as a second, <coughs> a second region that um, where we have done a lot of work that is uh, very much uh, uh online with the happiness is the rumpan uh, center in the north of sweden outside of uh, sundsvall um, where it was decided more than 50 years ago not by a leader of the communist party not by a socialist but simply by uh, the son of, of a captain of a, of a seafaring ship who concluded that it was absolutely necessary um to stop trying to earn more money to do much more and buy much more things that you could do yourself. So my friend architect uh, Anders uh, Nyquist, um, he designed the concept of the eco cycle. Um, and the eco cycle was very simple that he said he will work for money half of the time and he will only work for half of the money and with only having a quarter he wanted to demonstrate that it's perfectly able to live very happy very content use local resources and uh, have the capacity to welcome friends and family into a community the the, the eco village uh, rumpan uh, was already in its uh, original designs in 1964. So as you can imagine, uh, this is one of the earliest uh, uh, eco-villages. Um, the village uh, is older uh, than, than uh, any of the other eco-villages, including Findhorn. Um, and so uh, this uh, eco-village has been very successful in maintaining local fisheries, all year through summer and winter it has its own forest with its own fresh berries and mushrooms and uh, yes uh, they're sweets uh, they do eat meat they do go hunting and they do shoot the deer 
and they have some meat. Um, but everything is managed uh, through the local community. And uh, whereas no one is forced to stay inside and no one has to uh, fulfill very strict rules, um, the core purpose is that uh, whatever they build, they build together, whatever they develop as a local economy, they uh, develop together. For example, they have their own community sawmill, um, which uh, is used to build every single home, which of course is a wooden home, um, as we are in Scandinavia and a lot of wood is available. Um, so the Rumpan village, I would like to invite you all uh, to look at and the eco cycle homes um, because it is something that has been proven and now they're going into the third generation um, in the same uh, village. Uh, um, all the land has been purchased, uh, everything has been uh, developed, uh, they have no way of expanding anymore. Uh, but it is again one of those areas where the quality of life is such um, that uh, life expectancy is in the 90s, um, health rates are extremely uh, attractive, and uh, people have this uh, wonderful sense of being happy, healthy, and content. Um, there are quite a few other cases I can mention, but uh, to me, um, this this uh, this mix this blend of on one hand having a very clear intention uh, that what we want is uh, is health and happiness um, is uh, key second that we are clear that we will find solutions for the errors of the past and um, uh, let me just see what is the question here the name of the village is called rumpan let me just uh, write it down. Uh, room pan. There we go. Um, and the system is called Echo Cycle. Echo Cycle. No. Echo Cycle. There we go. Can you see it? Um, this, uh, this I hope uh, will, um, you can share with everyone, uh, uh, Sean, so that uh, we do not only have to uh, verify. Let me just, uh, you guys ask me to uh, say goodbye for a second to my son who has to leave and uh, I'll be back with you in one minute. I'm back. Sorry for the little break. I just had to say goodbye to my son. Um, I'm leaving tomorrow for Morocco. Um, so you see that uh, this this combinations um, allows us to to really think through how we can start redesigning our societies um, because it's not a matter of uh, just being sustainable or finding a new technology. <coughs> We're in need of. Uh, thinking through how we can redesign our societies. And, and, and the third part of my presentation, um, I wanted to, uh, to really uh, discuss with you uh, the need to, to rethink that economic model that makes this possible. Because our economic model of today is so much based on the logic that we have to be cheap. 
uh, on the logic that we have to compete globally, um, that we have to be cheaper than anyone else in the world. Um, but, but let us be very honest and very transparent. If, if you in Barcelona and, and me here in, in, in Belgium today, um, if I want to be cheaper than the Bangladeshis or the Chinese, um, you know, <coughs> it, it, it's, it, it's going to be impossible without cheating. Uh, cheating on the social side, cheating on the tax side, uh, cheating on the environmental side. I mean, there is no way we can be cheaper. And, and I see here this question about uh, cradle to cradle. Um, here is the very big difference between circular economy, cradle to cradle, um, and, and what I stand for today. Um, cradle to cradle and circular economy accepts the existing business model, whereas I refuse the, the, the existing business model. I don't believe that we have to compete globally. I think it's a waste of time to try to continue to compete globally in everything all the time, because we will not be able, as probably 190 countries of the world, to compete globally. There are only 10 nations in the world that are able to compete globally. So if you are from Germany, um, and if you are from the United States, or if you are from China, uh, or from Japan, you are free to think about cradle to cradle and to think about circular economy because uh, your, your mindset uh, of the competitive model being cheaper is, uh, of course, um, something that you consider viable. But the 190 countries of the world don't have that opportunity. And since we don't have uh, that opportunity, we have to look at what are we working with with what we have today? This is the key. Um, we, we must compete on the basis of what we have. And with what we have, we're not going to try to be the cheapest. We're going to try to generate most. Um, and when we are generating more with what we have, then we will be able to respond to the basic needs of all. The goal is not to beat the others on the market. I mean, we have so many unmet demands in our own home, our own home market, our own community. And therefore, we are in a desperate need to focus on generating value with what you have. And of course, very many people do not realize what they have because they've always been asked to measure uh, their performance against uh, the market leader. Now, let me give you a very concrete example from where I'm going tomorrow, Morocco. Who would ever expect Morocco uh, to be a world leader in the production of paper? I mean, uh, you, you listen to me and say, but Gunther, this time you, you're, you're a little bit off track because it's impossible Morocco to be a leader in paper because Morocco is a desert. It has no trees, it has no water. If you have no trees, you have no water, you have no paper. Well, that is as long as you stay within the existing business model. And now you can apply circular economy and cradle to cradle in order to design uh, paper without chemicals and you can design uh, paper so that you do not need to, to to cut the trees anymore or not so many trees anymore and maybe you can substitute trees with bamboo but what i am saying is that in a blue economy <coughs> we need to fi figure out what is locally required now morocco is a very uh, great exporter of fruits and vegetables exporting fruits and vegetables means that you need cardboard corrugated cardboard for shipment and where does it come from? Well, it's, um, it's cut trees. Uh, you cut trees, you make corrugated. And since Morocco doesn't have it, Morocco uh, imports three, 400,000 tons of corrugated cardboard every year to ship fruits and vegetables uh, uh, over to Europe. Now, what is the solution? The solution is very simple. And this is a project we are implementing right now. Um, the... the Morocco is known for its phosphate mines. 
when you have phosphate mines, then you have a lot of uh, uh, debris, then you have a lot of sterile material. And what do you do with the sterile material? Well, traditionally, we just pile it up. And when it piles up, we try to have some trees grow on it so that we reduce the dust. Um, and we're saying, well, why can't we take the finest parts of uh, the dust uh, from the leftover of the phosphate mining, we turn that into paper. And that paper, we will corrugate it and we'll turn it into corrugated cardboard. Um, uh, at first, uh, people thought it was a bit of a crazy idea, but since in China, there are already five factories, and since Morocco has uh, uh, the demand, uh, here is a factory for 400,000 tons of corrugated cardboard uh, that uh, can quickly be constructed uh, in Morocco. And even though the country has no trees and no paper, it can become a producer, a major producer of uh, corrugated cardboard. And what is the difference? The difference is that instead of importing uh, trees uh, transformed in Europe as cardboard, um, you are transforming waste material, dust material, material that usually contaminates, and you turn that into a material that will be able to export fruits and vegetables. Um, the difference for the Moroccan economy is immediately in the order of tens of millions of euros of revenue. You use what you have. This dust is not uh, problematic unless you do nothing with it. But once you know what to do with it, and once you can uh, regenerate it into a cardboard, and that cardboard, by the way, when it is shipped with the fruits to Europe, can very simply be turned back into pallets and shipped back in order to make it back into a cardboard. Uh, the beauty of it is that this is circular. This is free of chemicals. This is all what we are proposing. But the one major difference is that it is using locally available resources that are in abundance. Now, um, to conclude, um, what does it mean for an economist when something is in abundance? It means it is cheap. <laughs> if it's in abundance, that means it is cheap. And so this is the great advantage of uh, what we see when we apply uh, these uh, economic principles of using what is locally available, focusing on generating value, responding to local needs. And the end result is not yet happiness and uh, is not yet health and happiness, but it is resilience. And what we are in need in this transition period between the obsessive globalization and the obsessive uh, cutting of costs, uh, what we're in need now is a very clear cut strategy that allows us to pursue resilience. Our communities and our societies need resilience. And resilience is going to be in the next uh, decades as important as efficiency, if not more important. And, and again, resilience is done by design. You design for resilience. You don't happen to stumble into an economy where there is resilience. It is a deliberate strategy to achieve resilience. And so that's why I, I enjoy talking to architects, urban designers, because as architects and urban designers, you have an intention and that intention needs to be translated. And if we can blend it with an economic mix, if we can blend it with a technology mix, if we can blend it with our clear desire to be happy and healthy, I think we can be very bold and transform this world. Thank you. Thank you, Wander. I, I, I'm sorry that this virtual scenario has uh, uh, disappeared more or less the round 
applause that is so important at the end as a, as a way of thanking. Thank you, the, the, the presenter, the lecturer. In any case, it has been a wonderful lecture, a wonderful narrative, very clear and with very important, many important uh, ideas that we need to, to follow. Also, in these big particular times we are going through, as you say, conf confusion times, that, that things that is, the, is the best way to define them. Now, uh, I would like to open the opportunity for some questions. Uh, for the people that is uh, following the presentation uh, here, but also in the other streaming we have. Uh, maybe I can start with that, with uh, someone is, wait, someone's opening his mic, his microphone, someone wants to ask something now. I'm not seeing. I wanted to ask if you want to go first, go, then I will go. Yes, please, go on. Okay, um, uh, Ganto Wally, very interesting lecture. I really enjoyed your uh, thoughts. Um, <clears throat> you you mentioned about uh, the microfluidics and uh, the these capillary flows and things like this, uh, because uh, we were in the lab uh, uh, previously. We, we we used to use this material uh, as we have used uh, the nature of the microfluidics are comes from um, the material called PDMS or polydimethyl silicon. that there are other things like plastics they use, but the, the material itself, the PDMS is, um, is a polymer. Mm, what, what do you think about that? Do you think, uh, and uh, you, you mentioned a very large scale of the, uh, out of this microfluidics lab on a chip, uh, but how, how does it, at scale, does it work? That's my question. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, at scale, it is uh, like uh, stacks of CDs. So what we have done now is uh, we take uh, 600 CDs, 22 centimeter CDs. And, and yes, they're polymers. But uh, when the CDs uh, and the microfluid uh, channels uh, are, are full, and uh, saturated with the microplastics, then all of that will turn into a, a, a pyrolysis. So we will subject it to pyrolysis because we need to destroy the microplastics because um, you know we don't know what all the microplastics are. We cannot separate them into seven different types. And uh, we are in need of, uh, of uh, not only destroying the microplastics, but we need to destroy the additives. Now, um, if we have microplastics that may have already been in the sea for 50, 60 years, um, I can guarantee you these are top toxic. And so we need to really destroy the molecules. So that is why we are uh, focusing on our uh, uh, 1,300 degree uh, pyrolysis systems so that uh, we can have a, a, a maximum production of syn gas um, and uh, that will then permit us to to continuously cycle um, uh, one of these years we will have a better material than the polymer um, in the meantime um, we work with what we have uh, but as long as we have the opportunity to to destroy uh, the microplastics and destroy the additives, uh, then we are cleansing the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, before, in the middle of the presentation, someone was asking in the chat that, uh, when are we going to change our behavior? Are we going to change today, tomorrow? Is there any hope of change? <laughs> you know, um, you decide when you change. I mean, uh, I, am, I am not a dictator. Um, today, many governments uh, are very tempted to be very dictator-like and impose you everything, uh, every moment you move, any step you make, anything even you think, uh, you're subjected to uh, very dictatorial thoughts. Uh, I, I'm not a dictator. Um, my point of view is that you make up your mind and, and let's just remind us of Gandhi. Uh, if you want to be the change, well, be the change. Great. Uh, 
Angel is asking, how are global companies such as Coca-Cola, Nestlé, et cetera, facing the responsibility of reducing the plastic waste? You know, here is an interesting uh, word. Um, reducing plastic waste, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, eliminating plastic waste and cleaning up the errors of the past. I mean, uh, doing less bad is bad. Uh, reducing your pollution is still polluting. That's not possible. We have to go all the way to the other side of the extreme. Um, we have to stop with the idea of reduce, reduce, recycle. It hasn't worked for 40 years. I mean, we have been brainwashing people for 40 years, reduce, reuse, recycle. And what is the result? We've never had so many plastics in our lives before. So if you, after 40 years, come to the conclusion that it didn't work, well, don't try to do a little bit more of the same so that you get better results. Uh, that is not going to work. The first principle is it's not about reducing, it's about eliminating. Second, it is not only about eliminating, it's about cleaning up the errors of the past. And that requires a very clear business model that permits you to pursue that. Um, but this kind of business models is not the business models that our dear friends from Coca-Cola and Nestle want to embrace today. Thank you. Um, oh, Ignacio wants to make a question, sure, or in the wall next. Hello, Gunter. Uh, really nice conversation. Um, well, I mean, most of us, I think we are architects here and I really appreciate kind of a economical perspective towards the sustainable problem we're facing. And one thing that really triggered my mind that you mentioned is the locality of approaching towards the subjects. And I would like to know because I'm from Mexico. <laughs> and as you mentioned, I think not all of the countries in the world have the same ability to approach into economical solutions towards fixing these sustainable issues. So what is kind of your idea about these, as they are called third world or developing countries to really make uh, substantial changes and maybe not in a, I can say northern, northern globe way, but in an alternative one, because I think if we're really waiting for these countries to get developed <laughs> or maybe to get into this other system, probably the time will be not not enough. So I would just like to know your opinion about this subject. Uh, I think you're you're muted. Sorry. Anyway, um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that question. And let's let's be very clear. Um, uh, if you adopt solutions <coughs> from parts of the world that are characterized by four seasons, uh, then uh, you're in trouble in 80% of the world. Uh, we need to get rid of the syndrome of the four seasons. Um, the tropical world doesn't think uh, like four seasons. Uh, uh, nature doesn't work uh, in four seasons. Uh, um, you know, all the time and everywhere. So to me, there is a very important uh, first uh, consciousness is that we stop imitating the four seasons. Um, once we start stopping to imitate the four seasons, um, we have created the degree of freedom. Second is that we forget that um, if you're in four seasons, <coughs> then unfortunately, most things don't grow all year. Um, but if you are not in a region of four seasons, then you have food all year. The problem is that we have been forcing the same corn um, um, on every single uh, continent around the world. We have forced the same soya. Uh, we have uh, forced uh, the same uh, palm oil. We are forcing the same on everyone everywhere all around the time. And, and this is the first liberation that we need to do, is the rediscovery. I'll give you an example from Mexico, which I so much adore. Um, you know, when the Spanish arrived in Mexico, they found many great things, but uh, they, they were not so impressed with the bees because the bees were very small. Um, and so uh, the Portuguese and the Spanish started importing bees from Europe, which in the end were bees from Africa. And, and by now, 
uh, the pollination throughout Latin America has been destroyed uh, because it is highly dependent on, on imported bees. Uh, whereas uh, Latin America had its meliponas, uh, in, in Spanish we, they're called las angelitas, uh, and these are the stingless bees that are able to do a pollination um, of the vanilla, that they're able to do the pollination of the coffee much better than the big bees do. And, and somehow um, we have been obsessed by the productivity of those big bees in big colmenas in big beehives, so that the whole world thinks that we have to have beehives uh, that are uh, producing 20, 30, 40, 50 kilograms per beehive, um, forgetting that we have dramatically reduced the pollination of all the native and all the endemic plant species uh, of Latin America. Um, you know, it, it, it's to me one of those typical ignorances. Now, uh, why did we choose the African bee? Because per, per beehive, they had more honey, uh, but they did not pollinate more. But per beehive, they have more honey. But if you were to make the calculation how much honey is produced by the weight of one bee, La Melipona is producing, is the most efficient honey producer in the world. But, you know, they only have little colonies of 500 bees and not of a million bees. And so, therefore, we as human beings uh, from the Western world, we only see what is volume, uh, efficiency. We only see economy of scale. Um, we believe that uh, um, if we want to re redress the imbalances of the economies of the past and our obsession with the, the productivity from elsewhere, um, we need to go for a rediscovery, um, a rediscovery, I think, of uh, the local biodiversity. Um, uh, we are installing uh, thousands of little beehives uh, uh, for meliponas, las angelitas, um, uh, throughout Latin America. And, and we think it's going to be part of a, a rediscovery of the opportunity for so many of the pollination systems uh, that have been neglected um, because we are copying too much uh, the climates of the North. Yes, totally. And uh, I mean, just for complementing this idea, now that you mentioned the Melipona, which is, I think, characteristic from the Mexican Peninsula of Yucatan, um, currently that area is being developed, being developed urbanistically. <coughs> so for me, it's always like this contrast in between this, I don't want to use the word rural because it's not just that. I would say more like an alter alternative community that have lived in that region for a long time in sustainable ways. And now that this region has been developed urbanistically in a, as you mentioned, Western approach, how this, this area is basically changing into a sustainable technological way, which sometimes is not that clear how, how much it was more sustainable before than currently. Um, but I think it's, it's just a huge challenge to, to really understand a good way to, to find alternative solutions toward this problem. But thank you, thank you so much. My pleasure. There is a question, where is the book, The Economy of Happiness? It's not out in the market yet. Uh, there are only uh, 500 books that were distributed in order to generate an internal debate. Since the publishers uh, um, have basically stopped publishing, um, my book isn't published yet, but uh, we're planning in the next few months to have the economy of happiness out on the market. Great. Um, now, uh, Alina is asking, could you distinguish, please, between two terms, sustainable and circular? What core do you see of, for each term? You know, I think both have been greenwashed to, to death. <laughs> so um, I think the first problem is that uh, circular economy is greenwashing to death because it basically means multinationals looking for some use for their waste and, 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 and giving it some value and then claiming that they're generating jobs. Um, McKinsey is the big promoter, um, whereas uh, McKinsey in the end of the day is the biggest promoter in the world of cutting, uh, cutting down the number of jobs and, and streamlining business and being the cheapest in the world. So 
um, it's a bit of a contradictory that uh, McKinsey is the largest promoter in the world of uh, uh, the circular economy. Um, sustainability uh, at least has an origin. And, and let me again say that circular economy is exactly the same as industrial symbiosis, which was proposed uh, already 25 years ago. Um, but it was rejected uh, across the board by the industry. Uh, now it has been reinvented as circular economy, um, whereby we're doing some, uh, let's call it uh, uh, byproduct synergy, and we're recovering some energy from some waste products, uh, and where we're generating some additional uh, income uh, from some residue streams. Um, this, <coughs> this is, though, still in the same logic. Cut costs be cheap, compete global. Sustainability, on the other hand, um, that was defined for the first time in 1992 at the Rio summit. And sustainability was originally already conceived not only to be ecologically sustainable, but also socially sustainable. And that was in 1992, uh, uh, a very new concept, uh, uh, the ecological and social sustainability, which became sustainability. Great. Um, I don't know if anyone here, okay. If I, I, uh, I have one question from the other streaming. Uh, you mentioned that plastic was not designed to degrade. Maybe that is the center point today, how to degrade the things we have been doing. Um, you know, I think we have to uh, come to a very clear insight. Um, we learn how to put things together and we never learn how to take them apart. Uh, this is an amazing, we have engineers who study seven years in order to have a supply chain management to speed up how everything can be integrated. And then we have no one actually able to take them apart again. And so uh, it's not only that they're degrading, uh, we can't take them apart. Um, let's take a very simple product like a packaging like Tetra Pak. I mean, Tetra Pak, um, they don't know how to take uh, the aluminum from the plastics. I mean, they know how to put it together no idea how to take it apart. So they had to invent some furniture uh, schemes and they had to invent some other uh, ways and means of uh, using the waste. But in the end of the day, the only thing they can recycle is the cardboard that's sticking on the outside. But the aluminum and the plastics cannot be recycled because no idea how to take them apart. Now, to me, this is where education needs to make a fundamental uh, breakthrough. Um, I, I have requested that uh, any chemical engineer in four years time must know how to design a molecule that degrades uh, in the sun, in the sea and in the soil because the biodegradation is today defined by the European Commission only as degrading in soil. But what about the sun? What about the sea? I mean, we forget that the bacteria that degrade a plastic in the soil, these bacteria don't exist in the sea. And not only do they not exist in the sea, the bacteria that exist in the sea will conserve the plastics. I mean, this isn't, and then we say, oh, we've got a problem with plastics in the ocean. We got to stop single plastic. No, 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 no. It's not about single plastic use. That's not the issue. The issue is you've never designed for degradation in a salt environment. Be clear. Oh, well, thank you again, Gunter. I think we have to close considering the time, but I'm sure that Willy wants to make a, a comment before closing this lecture. That's it. Only, only to close this amazing section. Thank you so much, Gunter, for inspiring lecture. Uh, maybe we will have an opportunity very soon to see you presentially in Barcelona in a few weeks. And why not to organize a second round of this, uh, of this uh, discussion, maybe in a more practical way. 
Ok, thank you so much. Un placer. Gracias, gracias, muchas gracias, amigo mío. Otra vez por, por, tu, por tu presencia y por tu... Ya sé que eres una persona muy querida por nosotros y que tú nos tienes un aprecio especial. Te agradezco mucho eso. Gracias a ustedes todos. Thank you so much for having me. And again, my thank apologies you. for last week. All thank the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Chao, chao. Bye, everyone. Thank you for being here. Yeah, but...